I want to start with the cave, the cave of Odulum um, Transformational Training Academy, which you started uh, in Detroit. Uh, first, let's start with the name, Cave of Adullam. What mm -hmm. is the significance of the name? Well, the Cave of Adullam, um, we have all, you know, regardless of your faith, we've all heard of David and Goliath in the Bible. And so David, um, um, after beating Goliath, um, King Saul was jealous of him, make a long story short, and David had to run for his life and hide. And so he hid in what was called the Cave of Adullam. Adullam was a town in Israel. And the history goes that 400 men came unto David who were distressed in debt and discontented, and he became their leader. No one really studied what happened in this cave because those same men who were in debt, discontented with life and uh, distressed, when they came out of that cave, Jamil, they were called mighty men of valor. And so I started digging a little deep and what I found out that this cave, this cave was a refuge, it was a safe space. And so when I started the Cave of Adullam Transformational Training Academy, it started off with just fighting and martial arts with all my background and training, but I quickly discovered that the kids I was serving at the time in Highland Park, they didn't need to know how to fight. You already know that. They already know how to fight. They needed to know how to heal. And so when I started uh, the cave at the time, it was boot camp programs and scare straight programs. And I participated even in a couple of scare straight programs. And I said, well, wait a minute. How are we helping kids who are traumatized heal from the trauma by re-traumatizing them with prisoners? And I said, wait a minute, our boys don't need to be scared straight. They needed to be healed. And I kept the name of the cave of Adullam. It's a safe space where boys who are just spiritually in debt, mentally distressed, and just discontented with life can come in the cave of Adullam, let their guards down, heal, become trained, and be released as mighty men of valor men who are physically conscious, mentally astute, and spiritually strong enough to navigate through the pressures of this world without succumbing to their emotions. How did the documentary itself, how did that wind up coming together? It's interesting. Well, the viral video, like you're saying, in 2016, the first one, Breaking Through Emotional Barriers, where one of my students couldn't break a board. And I simply, I knew it wasn't his power because he broke the board the week prior practicing for the test. But it was his fear of failure that was stopping him from dealing with the pain and punching through the board. And so I dropped to one knee and I said, it's OK, son, we cry as men, because that's when he was crying. I had no idea that this was a major issue for men globally. I knew it was a, a black thing because I grew up in, the, in our hood in Detroit where the hyper masculine black male was the gold standard. And you know that, you know, if you didn't look that way, you didn't act that way. You didn't get the girls. You didn't get this. You didn't get the money. But when men start calling me from across the world, different backgrounds in life, crying to our women's staff, we had to shut our nonprofit down for two days because these men were so touched at the compassion I had for my recruit to cry. Because of that, several Hollywood producers contacted me when that video went viral. Um, at first, I turned all of them down. I didn't want to do it. You know, I didn't want it, the cave to be commercialized. And then I prayed and make a long story short, Roy Bank was the one I chose. He was very patient and kind and understanding. And him and uh, Lawrence connected through a talent agency one day. And he says, Lawrence, I need you to look at this. And when Lawrence saw the sizzle reel, he was moved. He says, hey, write a passage is so important to me. And, you know, many people didn't know Lawrence. Mr. Fishburne really isn't Lawrence's dad. And I'd have to let him tell that story. But when he shared with me his own desire for rite of passage and the father-son relationship, I mean, and, and he just was all in. And he said, look, we got to get this story to the world, Jason. It's so important. And it's one of the main reasons we have so many grown men still stuck in basements. We have to get them from childhood into manhood. And the cave is that vehicle that does that. From your experience with what you've done um, in, in the cave, as you connect um, with these young boys, the one thing I think is really interesting is that I, I think you said the first lesson you all learn or you try to teach them is how to fall. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. absolutely. Yeah. So why did you, why does the lesson start there? Mm. Um, I, I use myself for an example. Um, I, you know, I wanted to play the guitar growing up. Um, but during my era, that wasn't cool. You know, it was uh, weak. You know, you play football, basketball, sell drugs, or join eight mile sconies, you know? And so, uh, um, 
I I feared failure. I feared uh, what would happen if I took that route and it didn't work. And so often our boys in our community, they, in their hearts, they're telling them, look, I want to be um, a historian. I want to be a scientist. I want to be a doctor. Uh, I want to be a chef. You know, growing up in, in our era, you know, they would say, what was the, the saying? A woman's place is in the kitchen. And so how could a, this man be in the kitchen cooking? But now... It's like the, the 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 industry, the culinary industry is dominated by male chefs. And so it's important that we give our boys the freedom to make that mistake. And they fear failing so much that they say, look, I'm going to play it safe. I'd rather join this crowd than to join this smaller group, which is going to be harder because of the peer pressure, the work it's going to take to get there. But I don't have the support. I don't have the affirmation here. So I'm going to play it safe. So in martial arts and fighting, you know, Every fight starts standing, but over they say over 70% of the fights end on the ground. So we practice judo, so we teach them how to fall correctly. So I can throw you hard as I can. If you know how to fall correctly, smack the mat correctly, you can get back up. In life, if we teach our sons how to fall correctly, how to have enough money saved so when you make this investment in this invention, you don't spend all of your money that way if it doesn't, uh, um, work, you have something else to fall back on, et cetera, et cetera. And so once we remove that mistakes are, uh, once we teach them that mistakes are our greatest teachers, not our worst enemies. I mean, I've seen it. One of our um, evaluations, which I'm proud of, over 78% of our recruits improved their grade point average by one letter grade without tutor. And that's simply because we allow them the freedom to feel, the freedom to fail, and the freedom to get back up again once they fail without condemnation. And so that's why it's important that we teach them that it's okay to, to fall, to fail. The important thing is that you get back up. And what's the, the age range? Of, the age range the uh, currently, right, currently right now, we're starting at 12 years old. Um, it's right at the window where a boy is, where he should denounce boyhood and become a man. We initially started at age six. And because of that, we still have boys right now who are 16 who started with us at 86. And so we say, look, you'll be the last group to pass through the rite of passage. But moving forward, we had to make it a one year curriculum because we have like almost 800 boys on our waiting list. And it's like, whoa, we have to get these kids in. We have to make the training just as effective, but more concise. Because, um, I mean, our kids are suffering. You know, I, I get calls every day from schools, from parents, um, emails from all over the world. People want to fly here from Africa just for a weekend for me to train their sons. And so um, we had to con uh, condense the training down to one year. It's still effective. We not only do, of course, martial arts and emotional stability training, we have financial literacy, we have basic construction skills, uh, grooming and dining etiquette training, and workforce development. Um, is there only one cave? Yes. Yeah. Right now, it's only one case. Only yeah, one. and and, and we're trying. We thought about expansion, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, it's 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 asked a lot. It's a it's a desire of mine. Um, but as you know, it 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 costs. It's very expensive. Um, and we're a nonprofit, the union. And what's interesting, the Cave of Adullam is our most, uh, I guess, the program with the most demand, but it's the least funded. And so, majority of really? our other programs, yes, the majority of our other programs are funded through grants. And so because the cave is faith centered, we can't really get the government support that we need to really stand alone. And so to scale the cave right now, it's just me and my assistant, that's two people. Okay, the union has a full-time staff, executive director, uh, program director, director of operations, but the cave itself is under the umbrella of the union. So we need help. We have, what's great, we have some of our older students who come back now, they're, they're teachers as well. but really to really build out we have to scale here first you know create a, a replica replicable model here in detroit like maybe maybe southwest or who knows on the east side then once we can prove that it, it can sustain then we can move on to maybe chicago or the other cities that uh have requested a cave would be there and so yeah absolutely um the virtual training is important right now i'm sitting in a podcast studio i built for the students you know for them to have their voice for them to lead their own show. And again, we can do trainings from in here. And, but yes, Jamil, our desire is to scale it if, if, it's, if it's possible, but we need financial support and um, from foundations, from individual donors, you know, um, 
to really get us to where we need to be to create the scalable model. Well, it's um, I guess the the reason I'm surprised is because um, your you know the documentary and as people learned about you it resonated in so mm. many places. Mm. I mean, you have Will Smith sharing a clip of the documentary yeah, yeah. on his social media, um, the push up challenge uh, that you do with fathers and sons. Uh, I believe that was imitated on This Is Us, correct? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and I, I mean, and I, yes, it, on This Is Us and. I mean, it was actually on the Ellen show. And so, but I think people think when they see the documentary that we're rich, it's, it doesn't work like that. You know what I mean? And so, um, and, 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 you know, so just to be clear, 97% of our donations are for the cave, but the government funding, so we can't receive any of that. And so that's why we need the donors, individual donors, and of course, foundations. We do get funding from uh, foundations, um, but it's just not enough to scale what we're doing now. But um, I think people see that ESPN, and they think, well, we got some money. Like, no, we uh, we, we, we don't. And, and unfortunately, um, uh, when I heard ESPN, I was excited. Like, man, ESPN, all men there is perfect. But it's on ESPN Plus, and you have, you know, most of your sports heads there, you know. And so a lot of people don't have ESPN Plus. And uh, so people would just pay, you know, like they're going to the movies. They say, well, look, I'm going to pay like $10 and get the month subscription. And some people have kept ESPN Plus, but we're hoping eventually, um, which we heard, is eventually can go to Hulu and Disney Plus because it's all under the same umbrella. And that way more people will see it. And of course, I was excited when Will Smith shared it, um, and the kids here were excited. And so we just we want the word to get out, um, of course, scaling, but more importantly, to um, give you know parents another way of parenting. You know, especially fathers. You know, it's amazing the men who come here to watch their sons; they get to see themselves on the mat. And I can't tell you how many times fathers and sons are hugging and crying in here because. The father is unaware that he's not emotionally available to his son. He thinks his son only needs the warrior, but his son also needs the warrior to be a nurturer as well. And so for a father, not only to help his son heal, but to help the broken boy inside of him heal because his father wasn't a nurturer. It's, it's a beautiful sight to see. And so that's what we love from the videos, the testimonies from everyone who contact us. You hear the father saying, man, because of the cave, because of your books, I'm a better father and I'm a better man. I can talk to my wife without yelling now. Those stories is what really uh, makes the, the work worth it. And um, and that's, that's what we're looking for. But if we could scale that and then have another community take hold of that and spread it throughout, I mean, we could really experience some, some, some really he good healing and like I say, if, if trauma can be passed down, so can healing. And so we said we want intergenerational healing. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it needs to become a movement. So mm -hmm. uh, people, I'm going to need y'all to start writing some checks, especially Will Smith, you put it on, <laughs> on your Instagram. Will, I need you to write a check, my brother. <laughs> um, and tell Will to come on down. Let's train. I know he likes I training. Will. And, I will. Yeah. I will tell him. Yes, I will yes. absolutely tell him.